The first lesson for this first Sunday in Lent is taken from the book of Joshua chapter 7, beginning at verse 16. Our focus for this morning is the fact that <clears throat> sin is serious and the devil is serious, but we have a, a champion who is just as serious as the devil. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family for, come forward by man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, two hundred shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing fifty shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent the messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had, to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us in our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of our God. The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace are yours. From God our Heavenly Father, through his Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, our champion in the fight against the devil. Our text for this morning is the account of Luke of Jesus' temptation by the devil in the wilderness. This is right after Jesus was baptized. Now he is introduced to the work that he was about to do. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, I don't know if you would agree with me, but one of the most frustrating things that I find in my life is that when you're trying to work on a project or you're trying to get something accomplished, and it's kind of important. But it seems like you, you, you start it, and then something gets in the way. You get back at it, something else gets in the way. 
you try to get back to it at the end of the day something else gets in the way you're always being interrupted whether that's by people children whether that's being interrupted by a job you've got to come in today whether that's being interrupted by by the weather what have you whatever it is it's kind of frustrating isn't it when you're trying to do something that's kind of important and you just can't get the time to do it because you're always being interrupted. When I was in college, studying to be a pastor, <clears throat> this always came up. You're, you're, you're trying to study for a test, and, and usually, if it was me, it was the night before where you're really cramming for the test, or you've got a paper that's due, and it's due the next day, and you're trying to get that paper done, cranked out, what always invariably happened? Friends would come in and they'd say, let's go out. Just for a little bit, just for an hour, let's go out. And you're trying your best to crank out this paper or study for a test, a very important test, the next day. They say, you know something, we don't have enough for <clears throat> five on five. Can you come over? We want to play some basketball in the gym. Come on, just for a little bit. It won't take long at all. You'll get back to your studies pretty quickly. Or come, somebody comes in that says, we've got four, but we need a fifth for sheep's head. Just a couple of rounds, just an hour or so. You'll, you'll get back to your studies pretty soon. It got to the point where it was almost <clears throat> laughable. You're trying to do what you're trying to do. You're trying to do what you know is important and is more important than what you're being tempted to do, but you're being tempted to do just that. You're, something is getting in the way of what you want to get done. We, we actually came up with a name for it or a verb for it or a noun. We call the person that was tempting us to get away from our studies a Beelzebub or you're Beelzebubbing me in the verb form. You know why that is, why we came up with that word? Because that is one of the words, one of the Bible's names for the devil himself. And so for a bunch of pre-seminary students who, who, who are studying the Bible, that's what somebody come up. You're Beelzebubbing me. Stop Beelzebubbing me. But yet that's what we see Beelzebub or the devil himself doing constantly throughout the Gospels especially. And he's doing it not just for people like you and me. He's doing it against the one who was sent to do the most important thing in this life, and that was to go to battle with the devil, Jesus. One of the accounts that we have before us today, or the account that we have before us today, is probably the most familiar, the most well-known account of how the devil tried to get in the way of Jesus as he was just starting his ministry. This is, this is not his third year of ministry. This is first year ministry. Right after he was baptized, the Bible tells us, Jesus left the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Talk about a, a baptism by fire. Just after he had come out of the water, Jordan River, literally still wet, the Spirit leads him into the desert, into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for, four, <clears throat> for 40 days. At, at his baptism, he is anointed to be the Messiah of the world, the anointed one, chosen to be the one that is going to undo the work of the devil. And the very first thing that we see after this is Jesus going head to head with the devil. The light of the world that we talked about during the Epiphany season, is now going head-to-head -head with the Prince of Darkness that Revelation calls him. First temptation, the devil says, you are the Son of God. Turn these stones into bread. You know you're hungry. Forty days, you have to be hungry. What could be possibly wrong with that very simple temptation? You know, it's important to know how the devil works because if you don't know how the devil works, you're not prepared or you can't be prepared <clears throat> to fight him or to battle him. Do you really think he doesn't know what buttons to push in your life? Do you really think that he hasn't done his homework on you specifically? 
Do you think he's just got one game plan for every single Christian in this world and he's going to follow that game plan, whether it works or not? No. The devil is like an awesome offensive coordinator on a football team or a basketball team who, who studies the tapes for hours and he's looking for any kind of weakness, anything that he can exploit, Anything that he can kind of, as, as that woodpecker finds a, a soft spot, keep on pecking at so he can get to his prey. If your, <clears throat> if your particular weakness is worry, and that seems to be when we get a little bit older in life, the devil is going to fill so, your life so filled with other worries that you're not going to know which way is up. Have you worried about your children lately? Have you worried about your grandchildren lately? Have you worried about that car payment or that mortgage pay payment lately? That's what the devil does because he knows we are susceptible to worry. If, if, you're, if your weakness is lost, the devil is going to put you into so many different spots and situations where he can stoke those fires of lust in your heart. If your weakness is, I have to have this, and I have to have that, and I have to have the other thing, the devil is going to make you greedy over this and that and the other thing so that you focus on yourself more than you already do. The devil knows our weaknesses. The devil exploits our weaknesses. For, that's the first temptation. The second temptation, bow down to me and I will give you the world. The devil knows our desires in our lives. The devil even knows the good desires because you can have a good desire, right? There's, there's bad desires and there's good desires. So the devil knows the good desires. And sometimes the devil can twist those good desires so that you can only get those desires by sinning. So, so for example, a desire that most people will have is, I just want to be happy, right? I just want to be fulfilled, I just want to have my life straightened out. There's nothing wrong with those desires in our lives whatsoever. But the devil comes to us and says, you can have those, but not in the God-pleasing way that you should have them. He says you can have those by different ways. You want happiness? Do you really want happiness? Then do this, and you will be happy in your life. You can have all of these things if you just bow down and worship me. You can skip all the pain and suffering that you're going to go through between now and the cross if you just bow down and worship me. Again, sin can take the good desires that we have and turn them into bad things in our lives. I want to be happy. <clears throat> the times that I feel that I'm happy, I'm drinking. Is that really going to make you happy long term? What is drinking going to make you a, a slave to just some other master in your life? If you want to be fulfilled and happy, you say, I'm not really happy in the family that you've put me in, God. I'm not so, so fond of my wife or my husband. I'm going to try across the fence because it's greener pastures over there. What, what is that going to do? Is that really going to make you happier and more fulfilled? Or is that going to end up just in a broken relationship, another broken relationship in this world? Satan tries to convince us that certain things are going to make us happy, but he's lying to us. Do you, do you realize what the word Satan means? Satan literally means accuser or liar. The, 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 the hymn that we just sang, there's a last verse that says, One little word can fell him. What's the one little word that can fell the devil? People have wondered about that and have asked that question for 500 years, ever since Martin Luther wrote that hymn, Mighty Fortress is Our God. <clears throat> What's the one word that can fell the devil? Some people have said it's got to be Christ or it's got to be faith. What, what is the word? Martin Luther actually gives us the answer in his works. He says, the one little word that can fell the devil is liar. When the devil comes to you and says, you can have this, or you can be this, or you can do this, you can be happy and fulfilled, you point your finger in his face and you say, you're a liar. You're a good liar, but I know that you're a liar. And whatever you tell me is going to make me better in my life is just a lie. The, the devil makes constant promises that he cannot deliver on. Adam and Eve, they found that out the hard way. 
haven't we doing the same? You and I have fallen the same way. The devil makes promises in your life that we have fallen for, that are lies, but we didn't recognize them as such, and we have fallen for those lies in our life. That's the second temptation. Now the third temptation, just throw yourself down from this highest point of the temple, and God will take care of you. And the devil even threw in a Bible passage in order to kind of prove it. He says, isn't it written in the Bible that if you throw yourself, God's going to send his angels to keep you in all of your ways? What, what's the temptation here? The devil is trying to get us to doubt our God and doubt his promises to us. Doubt his presence in our lives. Doubt his goodness in our lives. Doubt that he can work even the bad things out for our good. Doubt that he loves us, bottom line. And we've been there as well, haven't we? Jesus knew better for every single one of these temptations. He knew what the Bible said. He knew that he wasn't going to twist it like the devil did. And so he simply said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. <clears throat> Three temptations. Jesus beats every single one of them because he recognizes who the devil is and what he's going for. So now comes the part of the sermon that says, here's a five-step program that if you just follow these five steps, you will master temptation in your life. You'll never have it affect you, bother you ever again. You'll never fall into sin again. Is, isn't that what everybody's looking for? Yes, I have been affected by temptation. I have fallen into temptation. What's the secret to not falling into temptation? There is no five-step plan. There is no little book how-to or, or how to avoid temptation for dummies. This is what God gives us. He gives us tools. He gives us spiritual tools to fight against the devil. If you think that you can mask the devil on your own, however, we're, we're sadly mistaken. Think again. But what's more important, however, than even that, is to see that the one who came to do battle with the devil is Jesus, our champion. To see that this is not just one battle between Jesus and the devil, but the first of many battles between Jesus and the devil. And it's important for us to understand that we need to continually fight against the devil's temptations. That's what God wants us to do. If we think that we're going to beat him on our own, we're lost. But if we know that we've got a champion who's fighting for us, then we know that we're going to be on the winning side. If Jesus had slipped just once in one of these temptations, if he had slipped just once in any of the other temptations that the devil put to him during his life, we would have been lost forever, lost in hell forever. But that day, this day, ended in victory for Jesus. But the war kept raging. Did, did you catch the kind of ominous words at the very end of our text? The devil left him until when? An opportune time. So the devil says, I've been beaten today, but I will be back. And you better be ready for me because I'm going to be back with a different game plan that's going to hopefully get you. But we know from hindsight and from the pages of Holy Scripture that the battle did rage for another three years until the day when Jesus did more than just suffer temptations or experience temptations for us. The day came when Jesus atoned for our sins and beat those temptations once and for all. We, we talked in catechism class yesterday about a movie <clears throat> that some of the kids were kind of thinking was actually the Bible I, I had given them an illustration earlier in the year, and they thought, well, the snake was in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, right? The snake was, was going over there, and then Jesus crushed the devil's head in that. That's not actually what happened. That's a movie. That's the last temptation of Christ. But that is the way that God said that the devil would be undone and beaten. Genesis chapter 3, verse, verse 15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, Jesus, will crush your head once and for all. Devil, you're going to strike his heel. You're going to cause him to suffer and, and lots of suffering and pain in his death. But in so doing, he's going to crush your head on Good Friday. And the world would make would have that known to them on Easter Sunday. In him, Jesus, we have a victory, 
not just in the temptations of our lives, but over sin and death and the devil himself. The victory is ours through faith in Christ Jesus, our champion. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.